So um, we're, we're going to go to questions. Um, just raise your hand and I will recognize you. I, I'd make two requests. Um, one, that it's actually a question so that we can have dialogue. And two, that it's not a long question um, so that we don't lose you over the course of several minutes. It's it's a short and to the point question. We'll start with Phil. And Vicki, do you have a mic? Uh, what, what is that one? Over? Nope. Okay. So Just ask you to explain a little bit further. 30% gets you union recognition. Is it 30% and is it the recognition just for the 30%? For, no, 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 for, no, the, for, entire, ever, for the entire work, yeah. For the entire workforce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's an obligation then on the union to represent member and non member alike? Yeah, sure. And yes. Is there any agency fee by law where non-members have to have to yeah. share in the cost yeah. of uh, yeah. representation? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's by law. We don't have uh, this. Uh, we do have some Scott Walkers, but uh, it's not. Uh, yeah, they're not very strong. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's by law. You pay a membership fee, and you pay, we call it uh, dues. And uh, I mean, I came I came in a little bit late, so I apologize for that. Sure. Uh, maybe you covered it, and then I'll catch up. Sure. But you, could you explain how the, all of this was achieved in light yeah, of was, in a right wing government? Ah, no, time? it's not. No, no. This the this is the 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 uh, um, that's the legacy. legacy. That's the that's the political historical legacy of the labor movement in Israel, which is the movement that established okay, the country. So when Israel was established, just to give you one example, in Israel established with no budget, with no money, with nothing in 1949, after the one percent of the Jewish population was killed in war and independence, Israel is installed the Free Education Act, right? That cost lots of money to the government. We have a social, we have a decent social security system since 1953, which is four, four, which is five years after the country was founded, and until the late 80s, 75 percent of the workers were, were, were members in the Eastern Route. So the legal structure, the social infrastructure of a, of, a, of, a, of of a country, all the institution. Again, we are lucky for that, you know, because uh, Netanyahu tried to break it. But the public opinion in Israel on social economic issues, right, is very, is very leftist, is very progressive. So even under, just imagine it, even after 10 years of Netanyahu, almost 30 years besides the period of Rabin, Barak, and Olmert, we had, we, we had a right-wing government, even with the right-wing government, with a, with a formal neoliberal policy, these infrastructures still remain, right? First, thank you, Rami, for coming. This was a great, a great to hear your your, your points. Um, I had a question following up on what Joanne said about the elections coming up. Um, you know, your movement is relatively young, and so maybe this is premature. Um, but is there thinking about the approach towards elections? Is the approach to get people to vote for parties of the left, or is it to continue voting for Likud or Shas and whatever, and work within those parties. So my my, uh, we, we spent most of the time talking about labor, which was exciting because I didn't talk about labor in the last five days. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but but uh, my current position, I'm I'm running a um, a leadership development institution that is affiliated uh, with the Labor Party in Israel uh, in the last year. Um, so I think that what you, uh, you know, um, we have some strategies about uh, about a get out a vote and about campaign. I'm not going to speak about it now, um, but I think that um, I think that what's important to realize about Israeli politics, and I know like three people that really gets it because you know uh, it's that the gap between the center left and the center right is maybe three or four mandates. That's it. Okay, that's it. In 10 years ago, which is not a lot in historical perspective, we had a center-left government that negotiated with the Palestinians on a peace agreement on the 67 border. It didn't end well. I think that both sides are responsible for that, by the way, like, like most of the negotiation with the, with, that we had. But the political system in Israel, and again, and it sounds weird because we had 10 years of an aggressive 
divide and rule, fear politics, right wing in government. Still, the I again like the label almost won the previous election. So I don't. So so there are lots of strategies, but it's important to emphasize that we first thing we can win. Even after 10 years of the right-wing government, 51% of the Israelis, according to every survey, according to, to any study that is being done on it, is support a two-state solution. And the Israeli public has been abused in the last 10 years of aggressive fear politics. I have lots of hopes, and I'm quite optimistic that after Netanyahu will, will, will end, I think that we have more, uh, that the chances are good. And even if it will, if it will not be a left government, I think that any government, maybe a center, center right, maybe like a grand coalition government, like we have in Germany, like like they have in Germany, that will not ins that will not conduct any incitements towards the Palestinian population in Israel. That will just n not try to interfere with the Supreme Court against the army, against the police. Is good enough for me in the next, you know, three or four years. Of course, my long vision for Israel is to have a, a, a left government, a progressive government that can negotiate. But under ten years of Netanyahu, you know, we need some, we need some, some, some kind of a, we need some, some respect in the public debate. You know, we need some dignity. So we need some political system that will not, con co you know, do a constant incitement every day. Um, but again, the gaps are really, really small in Israel. I just ask you in in um, to follow up on that another thing that I think people don't know about Israel. I feel like I'm doing <laughs> that's your, that's the work your that job. yeah the work <laughs> that um, the Israeli <laughs> ambassadors should be doing sure. instead of what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> but um, one of the other things people don't know are the right are the laws about voting. Can you explain? I mean, there's a big issue here about us being able to get out people to vote to get people to register to vote. Wow. Can you can you explain how that works in Israel? Yeah. Legally yeah. Registering and voting, and is there a vacation day for? Election? Yeah, there's a vacation day. You go to the you go you go with your ID and you vote. That's the rule in Israel in voting. No registration. You have to be a citizen. You have to be a citizen. You go with your ID to uh, to the closest uh, school or a kindergarten and you vote. No registration, nothing. That's the law. It's about 55 percent, 50, 55 percent. Uh, the positive thing that is happening is that uh, in the last election, um, the Arab citizens of Israel went out to vote in bigger numbers than before. Um, Prime Minister, as you, as as some of you probably remember, said in the last day of the in the in the in the election day uh, that uh, the Arabs are going to vote, and therefore the right-wing voters should go in mass numbers because the right-wing government is in danger. It's really hard for me even to tell this story because it was horrible. Uh, but I think another thing I think that uh, the percentage among uh, the Arab population in Israel, the voting percentage is extremely important for both Israel democracy. I'm a strong believer. I think that I'm the one of the only uh, people in the in the Zionists left in Israel that say that I'm a strong supporter of building a coalition between uh, the Arab representatives in the Knesset, the joint Arab list, and the Jewish Arab party, Hadash, and the Labour Party. I think that this Israel future is dependent on Jewish-Arab cooperation, not only in organizing, but also in politics. So I'm a strong supporter of this. I wouldn't say it's the mainstream approach about the left, but uh, uh, I'm a, I'm a supporter on this. And the, the I, I don't know if you heard about, but the, the leader of the joint Arab list uh, is, a, is a very brave politician. Very brave politician. Ayman Oda is also a big supporter of building a cooperation between the, between the center left and the joint Arab list. Good morning. Um, my, our youngest son uh, just started on Sunday his fourth year at Tel Aviv University, and I don't think he's coming back. He says, you have Trump, we have Bibi, but the deciding factor is we have better hummus. Um, Leo mentioned hand-in-hand -hand schools, um, and uh, I was fortunate, fortunate to visit uh, the one in Jerusalem uh, last spring. Uh, they just announced they're opening another one in Haifa. Can you tell us a little more about 
what happens in the hand-in-hand -hand schools, and also about any of your any of your efforts in um, the rest of the public school system in terms of uh, education. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the hand-in-hand -hand schools and the what makes them unique, and then Rami will talk about organizing and what's going on in the schools. I'm not going to talk about the. Um, the AFT is working, and, and they're this, the amazing staff here are doing incredible work in helping to raise and engage with pedagogy and the teachers um, at the hand-in-hand -hand schools. But I want to just put the hand-in-hand -hand schools in political perspective, which is, I think, what you're asking. Israel has a very segregated society that has grown up from, um, from the creation of the state. It is something that's often, you'll hear the word apartheid thrown around. Um, I very firmly, and I know Rami agrees with me, do not believe anybody who looks honestly at the laws of the country will see that there's not, there's nothing even remotely like apartheid in the country. There is, there is segregation, there is r racism, there is, a, there is, there is, there is, you know, the things that we know exist when societies live separately and when, when one society is, is created, uh, is treated unequally. But for a range of issues, and when I started to research this issue, I was surprised personally to see, having worked with Israel and in Israel for so many years, that in fact, originally it was the UN agreement and the creation of the state where Israel agreed, based by the UN, that it would keep a separate education system for the Arab population. That never gets into the it debate. Their demand it was their said. demand. It was their yeah. demand. And part of the the, so the problem that exists now in the Arab sector in Israel, in the education system, is a level of inequality that's inexcusable. That's the one thing. And secondly, there is, it's, and this is a much more complicated conversation, but um, there is a very strong, there's a debate in Israel where people like Rami or me or that people that we would be allied with support strengthening the bilingual nature of the state strengthening and um, raising the level of Arab culture inside the, the whole state, you know, questions of the symbols of the state, the, what are national holidays, all those issues are debated on the progressive side. And the right wing wants to reduce it and create a kind of xenophobic nationalism for the country that, that goes against what the original founders of the state, if anyone who looks at the, um, the Declaration of Independence, you'll see the language that lots of us progressives always quote about creating equality across for minorities and for, for the range of cultures. So the education system was created and grew up in this level of inequality. Um, and the schools are separate and not equal. Um, there are different tracks in the school system. One of the mistakes, many mistakes that, you know, we've been talking about the mistakes of the right. There were many mistakes on the left that were created, and one of them was in one of the tracks that were created through the public school system was a secular, socialist, educational track that, um, that, the found, that, the, that the Labor Party and the Labor leadership through the years got rid of. So. Um, What's happened now is these schools have been, and there's almost all public schools. There's almost no notion of private yeah. school in Israel. There are a few that have propped up. There are lycee schools. There's American schools, international schools. But for the most part, the concept of education is public schools. So what happened is, um, because of this separation of education, there were activist parents who started with, the first school was in Jerusalem, I believe, in the school, yeah. the Mexrain school. Um, started to try to create, bringing Jewish and Arab school kids together to create a bilingual classroom that would be completely respectful of the culture of both, have two teachers in the classroom, Jewish and Arab, together. Um, it caught on. There now are um, about 1,500 kids being taught in the schools that are expanding. As Rami said, there's a new one opening at Beit Beryl, where he is, and there's the Haifa school has been, I also work with the Reform yeah. Synagogue Movement, and that's been worked, that's been based in working with our, our synagogue there, where we've had, um, started as a kindergarten with our synagogues, um, but now it's now expanding. Um, Haifa has a large Arab community, and it's the only really mixed city in Israel. Uh, and the most important thing is, even under this right-wing government, the hand-in-hand -hand schools have now been, that network of schools has now been adopted as a public yeah. school system. Yeah. So for the first time in Israel, under a really right-wing, xenophobic, nationalist government, 
you have a stream that people can enter into the school system that is joint Jewish and Arab. It's still very small. It's different, but one of the most important things, again, coming back to sort of what we can learn in terms of shared languages and shared, and shared ideas, is that what the school program, what the hand-in-hand -hand schools have done in the last few years is they've shifted their own way of acting. They've turned themselves into what's called an Amutan Israel, which is a nonprofit for us, and they've started to engage the whole community. Yeah. It's similar to what the teachers' union is doing around community schooling, so that they engage with the parents. They engage with community leaders. They engage with imams. They engage with people to try to really influence and change the community, which is something very different yeah. and is, is becoming a social movement. Yeah. Can you just explain it in Israel, what you <laughs> just said? No, but I think, that it's, it's, um, I think that this is a perfect example how a work of an American organization yeah. like AFT with us and with the bilingual school is extremely effective in helping us to build a progressive infrastructure of Israel. I know that many, uh, many dear people are trying to figure out how to build relationships between progressives in Israel and progressive in the United States. I think this is a perfect example. You know, the bilingual school are very strategic to the future of Israel, you know? Uh, and luckily, they sit. Uh, the the school in Beth Bell sits about sits about uh, 60 meters from my office. You know, so I get to see it every day. My wife actually wants us to move to Beth Bell, but my mother lives in Tel Aviv, so there's no hope for my wife, right? So we are we are staying in Tel Aviv. But anyway, yeah, that's this is a perfect example for good involvement. Uh, if, if I could just say, when people get to university, universities are mixed, uh, um, yeah, sure. and the numbers are starting to change in university to a really astounding. Yeah astounding number the percentage it's over 30 I think it's it, they're now equal in certain of the universities there's equal the 21 percent of the Arab population in Israel is now equal in the universities it's 30 percent at Haifa University yeah. but at um, Technion which is the top at Technion medical school it's now very very strong Arab women Palestinian Israeli women who are studying medicine um, and there are students my cousin who just started at Hebrew University her students her friends that she became um, friends with immediately were two Palestinian um, students from East Jerusalem. And now my cousin wants to study Arabic all of a sudden. So people, the, the younger generation is also understanding that, and they travel a lot and they see that they're living in this global economy and they can't be so yeah. segregated and separate. So again, yeah. it's, it's a sign of hope that, yeah. that Rami is, is tackling onto. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to you, a few years ago, I heard you speak at the AFL-CIO about um, power to the workers. And uh, my wife and I, after we retired, lived in Haifa for 10 weeks. And I met with um, Rafi Kami a number of times. And uh, met it's with Avital Shapira at the uh, Histadrut and with the Palestinian General Trade Union Federation. It's very interesting. But what I, what I want to ask you about is that there's a program of cooperation, I understand, between the Histadrut and the Palestinian General Trade Union Federation to support the Palestinians who come across every day to work in Israel. Is uh, Power to the Workers and SEA doing something around the problem of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Palestinian workers who come to Israel to work? They have to go home every day. Sure. Um, uh, so I'll leave it at that and ask you uh, to uh, address that. Yeah. Um, so power to the workers, which um, uh, it's <laughs> it's funny for me to talk about it because it's not uh, really in my in my daily work in the last uh, five or six years. But it's it's a relatively very small organization. Most of the impact that power to the workers did is actually in two um, terms. First, it's moved the Easter route to be much more proactive than it was. The Easter route are doing extraordinary really 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 good work in the last five or six years in organizing new workers in the Easter route there's a new wave of young people joining the Easter route becoming really high up in the in organization so it doesn't have the power that the Easter route has to to deal with Palestinian workers uh, but as I mentioned before uh, the one of the uh, few of the stronger unions that was established in Israel both in Kohl of the and 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 the Easter route are composed of uh, of, of uh, Jews and Palestinian together we are trying to develop, this is partly the things that we are doing with the AFT, uh, a program that will build a progressive leadership 
with labor leaders, both Jews and Palestinian, in order to just uh, had a conversation with uh, with that yesterday with J. David Cox over there, that that the, the we have uh, the challenge is to to um, um, the challenge is to um, uh, use it's not using right it's to ter it, it's to make this wave of organized labor something that has an effect on the political system in Israel. And because the unions in Israel are so disconnected from politics, like Joanne mentioned before, you know, we have, we have, uh, we have all the parties have some kind of a presentation within, within our labor unions. I know it's, it will sound real, but it's, it's like this in Israel. We have a challenge to, to, uh, to, to go to the labor leaders, to the new labor leaders, and to work with them also on progressive politics. This is something we are trying to tackle in the, in the, in the upcoming years. So my question is about the health insurance um, in Israel. The, um, and two parts. One is what can we learn from Israel on health insurance, even uh, so many changes um, under um, sort of right-wing government, but you ha seem to have achieved something that we are still struggling for. But then the second question is, with the changes, um, when Kopat Halim was tied to the Histrojut, um, and then the change to a different system in terms of the relationship of the government to health insurance. Did that um, have something to do with um, the loss of power that yeah, history sure. had? And what can, so, so first of all, what can we learn from the system uh, at the national level? And then second, what can we learn as a labor movement that had a health insurance uh, system mm -hmm. that lost it and lost membership? Mm -hmm. So actually, one of the reasons for the loss of the power uh, in the labor movement is because what you are saying. It's it's. I'm I'm. I think that because of I, I assume that the most of the people here are not familiar with it because it's a very you know like it's a very nuanced thing. So just I want to say just one sentence. Yes, it has to do with it, and it has to do with that that the one of the former leaders of the of the Sadrot in '95 uh, have said that he w he wants to Americanize the Israeli labor movement. So he Americanized the Israeli labor movement. And it lost power, and unfortunately, since then, the leaders of the Istradut and other unions are are smarter. You know, uh, you know, the current leader doesn't want to Americanize labor. <laughs> Israel labor which was actually organizing new workers and is building more power. Uh, the Israeli health system is a great system. Uh, it's a public health system. You can't choose within this system. It's a very socialist system. It's universal health care. It covers the majority. Uh, you have some private arrangements, you pay maybe $20 a month. With $20 a month in Israel, you get everything. Everything. Okay, so I have, like, you know, I have nothing to elaborate on this because it's a very simple system. And I think what, what needs to be done, maybe the political lesson is that the middle class is actually the, um, the one that has the most interest in maintaining a public education, in, 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 in the fact that we have a public health system. So it's a coalition, it's a political coalition that uh, uh, um, is very crucial to the existence of the Israeli welfare state between a uh, strong, in uh, uh, strong incentives that the poor and the middle class share together to maintain a public education and health system in Israel. One of the things they don't have that we struggle with is there's no pharmaceutical lobby to speak of. Exactly. Um, anyone who gets sick in Israel will be shocked by how inexpensive medicine is. And there's no, the doctors are not well paid in Israel. They're paid as working as if they were all just working as public. Exactly. exactly. And so there's not a strong medical lobby to maintain a certain status, if anything. Everybody again is together trying to raise the standards of the public, of the public sector. But the best place to get sick is in Israel because not only are there good doctors, but for Americans to go there and see what we have to pay out of pocket, it's just yeah. it's extraordinary. So when I almost died when the prime minister said that the Arab are going to vote, <laughs> I went to an Israeli hospital and I received really good uh, treatment. <laughs> By so. an Arab doctor, most yeah, likely, true. and that's the other thing. The heads of most. Of I have recess duty, so I need to go. I'm actually a teacher. 
Um, uh, but I also taught in the Middle East, and um, I really appreciate what you're saying about the importance of solidarity for the Palestinians. And so I have two questions. One is, are you working on the content of textbooks so that there is a way of, like Zohrat, I know, has uh, worked on uh, renaming uh, Palestinian villages that were demolished. And then also, the Palestinians have called for boycott, divestment, and sanctions as a way of creating uh, a political impetus. And I wanted to know if the Israeli Teachers Union is supporting this kind of um, process. Would you support a movement that is saying that uh, the United States needs to be boycotted because of uh, lots of the sins that is being doing in the world? Yeah, I would. Okay, so I we would. are not supporting it. I would support that, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we're not supporting it. Um, some of the Palestinians call for BDS. Some of the, uh, s uh, lots of Palestinians, uh, they don't support BDS. Uh, uh, my friends in the Palestinian Authority who are young political leaders don't support BDS. Uh, Joanne friends in Palestine don't support BDS. It is not a formal voice of the Palestinian people. Palestinian Authority don't support BDS. So it's a complicated situation. I, of course, I'm very against BDS. I'm against the description of Israel as a colonialist project. We didn't, who were my, f were my grandfather colonialists for? They came to establish a state. They were not sent by an empire to Israel and Palestine. They came to establish a sovereign state, a state that had made many, many mistakes. But it's a legitimate state, la state like any state in the world. And we, as progressive Israelis, all we are saying to the Israeli right is, if you accept the self-determination of the Jewish people, you must accept the self-determination of the Palestinian people. And what the BDS movement is saying is something very, very differently. Uh, the movement that you support didn't declare, didn't say that it supported a two-state solution on the 67 border with the Jewish democratic state and the Palestinian state. If it would say that, maybe we will have something to talk about, right? Um, so I will not support a movement that denies uh, the Jewish people right for self-determination, that, that doesn't acknowledge the fact that we have to have two states. And, uh, and the, the biggest, um, um, actually, uh, I think that the movement that you support helps the Israeli right to win um, in election in Israel, because the narrative of the BDS movement is that uh, all the worlds are against us. And the movement that you support, um, it uh, demonstrates to the Israeli people that all the worlds are against us. So uh, this is my uh, my response. What about Ahmed Tamimi? Yeah, so, um, so we're going to move around to other questions, but I do want to say, given that we're, we're meeting at the AFT and the AFT is sponsoring this, I do want to make clear what the AFT's um, position on this question is. And so the AFT has resolutions adopted by our convention that makes clear that um, we support um, national self-determination for both Israel and Palestine, a two-state solution. Um, and um, and in, in that regard, um, we do not um, support boycotts of Israel, which questions the legitimacy of the Israeli state. Um, so we believe that, that just as there's a right for Palestinians to national self-determination in their own state, um, there has to also be a right um, for Israelis to national self-determination in their own state. So I just want to make, make clear what, what our position on the question is. Um, other questions over there? Uh, thanks, Remy. And uh, my name is Ed Fegan. I'm a uh, retired uh, CWA member and uh, AFL-CO staffer. Uh, I appreciate what, what you've said in terms of uh, hopes for a two-state solution, programs like Hand in Hand. But I, I, th I think also a growing number of people feel like those hopes are being overwhelmed by facts on the ground. And I think particularly, you know, I think it was interesting, Michelle Goldberg uh, in January, wrote a piece in the New York Times says, "Liberal Zionism dead," and she thank raised, you for that. <laughs> she raised, you know, I mean, she pretty she came about as close as she can to saying that the two-state solution is dead, which is a position that a lot of people are taking. And uh, 
She also said that, you know, with you raised the question, Joanne, about apartheid, she said it's becoming inescapable to use the word apartheid when you discuss the Israeli government's policies towards Palestinians. So my question relates to what we do here in the U.S. And, you know, a growing number of people, young people, Jews like myself, uh, have come around to supporting BDS as a nonviolent tactic, which is a, a, a great tradition, and, uh, certainly in our country with the Montgomery bus boycott, with the UFW uh, grape boycott, with our support for the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. And, and we think it's a legitimate tactic to pressure the government. And we're often vilified as being anti-Semitic or, or, or wanting to destroy Israel. And that's not what uh, uh, certainly I feel as, as a supporter of BDS. And I know a lot of other American Jews don't feel, uh, you know, are certainly not anti-Semitic. But my question is, uh, I guess, for, uh, for either of you, I mean, some local unions, there's been a few, also the Connecticut AFL-CIO, have passed resolutions that either endorse BDS or have called for the labor movement to consider BDS. And uh, as union leaders, and I, I wish Randy was here because I'd ask her this question, uh, should national leaders be trying to override the dis democratic decisions of local unions that choose to support BDS? So I can... I, I, I'd like to answer first and channel Randy, if that's okay, for a minute, since I, she actually raised some of this with me on her way in to settle the uh, West Virginia strike. Um, first of all, I, I know Randy and Leo and the rest of the wonderful staff who are here who have been involved with this issue can, can speak to this, but Randy believes in dialogue. and. Part of the reason the union does what it does in engaging across the board with progressives over there is to keep dialogue going and to open up. I don't think, it's certainly not appropriate for me to speak about what happened with the Connecticut AFL or with the auto workers or anybody else. I know the history of that. I don't think that's frankly pertinent to the conversation we're having here today. Um, so, but I wanna say something about your struggle and BDS from my own point of view having been you know, Leo just mentioned a little bit of my own background. I have a lifetime, if you probably know, I mean a lifetime of engagement on this issue and have debated a lot of people on this issue on BDS from the left. Um, the, there is real, I get it. I mean, as someone who's spent my whole life fighting for a two-state solution and for a kind of Israel that I would love and I still love, um, it is very, very frustrating. And seeing the facts on the ground are very difficult and disheartening. I thought, uh, Michelle Goldberg is a friend of mine, I'm having lunch with her on Friday. I thought she went a little too far in what she said, that won't surprise you. Look, facts on the ground are only facts that can also be uprooted. There is no reason in the world that if, you know, what Yitzhak Rabin tried to do and was killed for, um, that another leader could not come in and do. So um, that's number one. The, the settlements, I, I'm in there all the time. I go, I'm, I, I'm, I don't go to Israel without also going to Ramallah. I spend a lot of time, I was in meetings in the Mukata and with advisors to Abu Mazen just a few weeks ago. I see on my way to Ramallah, I see the settlements. I see everything that's going on. I, I know very much on the ground of what's happening there. But facts on the ground can also be upended. That's number one. Number two, let's not forget, the Palestinians themselves want a two-state solution. I'm leaving after this meeting to go to meet with a very high official of the Palestinian government, very close to Abu Mazen. They are struggling for a two-state solution. They want a two-state solution. The reason they're not talking to Trump right now is they want a two-state solution. They're equally frustrated, as any of us who care about this issue are, but they have not one of them has said in the leadership of the Palestinians, we want a one state. There are people who are now saying, as I hear you saying, it could be inevitable because X, Y, Z, but they want a two state solution. So that's number two. Number three, what Rami said, I just, I see it with my own eyes every time I go over there. I see it in my work in the Jewish community. The, um, the um, idea of boycotting Israel has only strengthened the Israeli right wing. There is no, it has done nothing to hurt the Israeli economy, by the way. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Zero, zero. Any study, every study will show. It's not just things the government is putting out. Any of us who spend a lot of time on this will see. It has done zero, had zero impact. And if, in fact, it were a real thing, if Europe really cared, the number one trading partner with Israel is the European Union. 
if Europe really cared about this and was willing to forego all the goods and services they get from Israel, and especially high tech, that could potentially damage. They don't, and it won't. So the BDS, what it is, is a thorn in the side of the Israeli left. It's damaging to the Israeli left. I believe it's keeping things from the Palestinians in terms of higher education and other things. And it is strengthening the, the American Jewish right and the Israeli right. So if those who want to support the B, and I get, you know, it seems like it's peaceful disengagement and that's great. What I would argue is instead of boycotting, do what Randy has organized her union to do, which is honestly, almost revolutionary and unprecedented, and I hope that other unions will join in doing this. We have another distinguished union president here. To be able to engage in worker-to-worker -worker solidarity, to strengthen the hands of the left and progressives, both Jewish and Arab, inside Israel, and then with the Palestinians too. The Palestinian Trade Union Federation, the PGFTU, is a more complicated matter. There are lots of not good progressive politics going on on the Palestinian side right now, and they don't have the freedom there that, that frankly, the Israeli unions do. But being able to strengthen that work with the Solidarity Center and other great work that's going on on the Palestinian side to promote democracy for workers is very important. That's what will make the difference. The BDS movement is destroying the left in Israel. So if you want to keep doing that, go for it. But please look for other ways. This union is offering you other ways. Rami can offer other ways. There are lots of ways to do worker-to-worker -worker solidarity that will make a difference. So, um, you know, in the American labor movement, um, we respect the rights of different unions to figure out issues on their own. We're responsible here for what the American Federation of Teachers does. Um, and in that respect, I want to say that one thing that's very important to us as a union of educators um, is that the idea of an academic boycott um, is just anathema to us. Um, we believe that the essence of education is dialogue, um, that the way that people move forward is to learn from each other, um, to be in communication with each other. Um, and so, you know, that's a position that um, that, that we have clearly articulated in our national convention, um, which is, as, as it should be, the highest decision-making body in a democratic union. Um, and so um, I, I just want to, you know, each union will find their own way, and, um, but we want to be really clear about what our way is. Um, I, and just on a, on a personal note on this, um, I, I think that one needs to take seriously the fact that even a Noam Chomsky, um, who I have um, disagreed with at various points in my life in public ways, that even a Noam Chomsky um, has said that he thinks that um, BDS is, is not a way um, for Americans um, to move forward um, and to help uh, achieve social justice and uh, national self-determination for Palestinians um, in the current situation. And so, um, um, and, and I think th that that strategic consideration, that what has to be at the heart of everything that, that we do here is how one actually moves that forward um, in the Middle East. Just, I, I want to add, um, I, I of course, put, um I support everything that Joanna Leo said, but I just want to add one thing. Israel has, has, has took all the settlements out of Gaza 10 years ago. Israel has signed a peace agreement with Egypt and Jordan after horrible wars that we had. Why the hell we can't take out the settlements? Why? Is all the countries in the world can change except Israel? Progressive can win in other countries after long years of a right-wing government, but in Israel, we as progressive will always lose? It's it's a it's really it's really um, you know it's a it's a very weird concept it's a it's a very weird thinking that you isolate is that you think all all liberal democ like all the countries in the world you know you have different co you have different political movements think and change war or peace but in Israel always the status quo will remain in a country that only celebrate that now we are celebrating our seventy years seventy years that's it that's it. We had, made 
peace with two uh, brutal enemies, took all the settlements out of Gaza, still making lots of mistakes. As I said, occupation is, 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 the, is, the, is the biggest threat on Israel's security and moral standards. This is a pessimistic view that had no, that had, that, you know, has no reasons, has absolutely no reasons. Hi, um, thanks for speaking with us. Um, I just wanted to bring it back to something you said earlier about the politics of the United States and the politics of Israel being in a similar place now more than before. Um, and I know as a member of J Street U, um, when the politics of the United States shifted in the past year or two here, um, we really had to change how we thought about <clears throat> organizing. Um, and I'm wondering, in a government that's not really receptive to progressive organizing and ideas, how do you create change on the ground when you can't look to your politicians? So actually, uh, the, 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 the response that, that like the, the things I said in the past were really new strategies and new tactics that we use with understanding that we have a very right-wing government. Because if we had a centrist government, you know, if we had a government that has some respect for the working class in Israel, maybe we, we use different strategies. But I just want uh, to, to stretch how uh, revolutionary it was to, to, to go to people that were unorganized before, that are voting for the right, that they live in the far periphery in Israel, in the north, in the south, in Palestinian villages, in ultra-Orthodox community, communities that the, the idea of organized labor, the idea of a labor movement was never there to go to organize them. So this is one very strategic tactic. This you actually, I think this is the biggest story of the Israeli left. This is the, this, this is the biggest a success story of the Israeli left. The second strategy that I think is very, very crucial, and I mentioned it before, I think that the delegitimization of the Arab population, the Arab citizens of Israel, is a central strategy to the right-wing government. And I think that we as, as, as progressive need to, need to do the exact opposite. We have some people in the left, I have some of my best friends, I have a long conversation about it, say, well, the debate is moving to the right, we should also move to the right or move to the center. I strongly disagree. I think that, that, I think that progressive shouldn't sound, we should sound like progressives. And I think when the, if, the, if one of the main projects of the Israeli right is the delegitimization of the Arab citizen, we should legitimize it. We should help them to be part of the political game, which, in, which would, we should encourage them to vote. We should build coalition with them. We should build organization with them. We should build union with them. We should build kindergarten and, and school with them. So this is a strategy. They delegitimize the Arab citizen. We are not playing in this game. We are not playing in this game. We, we, we're, gonna build, we're gonna cooperate with them to make them legitimate political partners in a future center-left coalition. So uh, for the last 20 some years, I've had a loose relationship with Mirkaz Adva. Ah, oh, wow. Uh, so that's um, a progressive, that's a progressive uh, think tank in Israel that right. we work very closely. And the work yeah. is very pioneering in, so in, in terms of social economic justice. Just right. to tell everyone what's Mirkaz yeah. Adva is. Right, and yeah. so, um, which ha has a relationship to the organization I worked with here as well. So Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, yeah. So um, the, um, uh, so it's sort of a question of allies, you know, sort of how uh, is this part of, I have a couple questions, but uh, one of it is, you know, obviously, so you're, they're your ally, I had discovered that from Maya when we, earlier, but the, um, um, and so in turn, but the, you know, it, they don't have that many, you know, allies. It's difficult and, you know, or it has been over the years for them to, um, um, get support. I mean, their work is great, but and the um, and so a, a question of um, I don't quite understand what the if it's a co the relationship between um, Koach Laovdim and uh, the Histadrut, whether that is cooperative or competitive. It's competitive. I'm it's I'm competitive. I'm fortunate to be out of this competition for okay. the last six years. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a regular speaker on television of every fight that Histadrut has. I'm a strong supporter in in all the unions, including the teacher union in Israel. So um, there is a competition that I can say here is good for the Israeli labor movement. But, uh, can, I, can I 
I just it, very quickly just explain to people what Koach Levdim is and make an American comparison, to, again, to bring it back to how we can do work together. Koach, when the Histadrut historically had made a decision to really not organize low-wage workers, many of whom were also what are now are asylum seekers or Palestinians coming in from the territories um, to work during the day as day workers, um, and the lower sectors of the society, Koach Labdim was created to organize those workers. And it also takes a model somewhat similar to what we call here worker centers, where it really engages with the workers' lives. And it, it built itself up as an organization where it really started to challenge the mores of the histadrut and shame them into ignoring these low-wage workers. Historically, the histadrut has organized the workers who were part of the state industries, who were high-wage. So part of what Rami's talking about, about the change, is also this coming together of this worker center idea and organizing low-wage workers with putting that in the face of the traditional union saying, you got to do this. And it sounds, I think, very familiar to a lot of us in the room who, you know, when I was working at the clothing and textile workers union, and then with the hotel workers and others, the worker centers were, of course, very, very important to that. Yeah. Okay. But again, it's important to emphasize in the, uh, I know I said it, but the, the Istadrut in the last five right. or six years is a very successful labor union that has lots of successes, uh, increased the minimum wage five times, are making really, really great achievements for the Israeli workers. So it's a completely different situation now when we established the, the union. That's great to hear. If I could do a second question, oh, um, which is, how is your work supported? Um, is it, how is your work supported financially? financially? My work? Yes. I I ah, by donation, of course. <laughs> It's an NGO. Yeah, it's an yeah, NGO, yeah. yeah. It's so, not so easy yeah. to find progressive sort. I know from helping. Yeah, yeah. Part of the... Us, so the yeah. it's not so easy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listen, part of the... part of the Because this is not a fundraising event, I can talk, you know. like But part of the reasons why the Advance Center and why the Social Economic Academy and one and, and, and some progressive institutions that focus on social justice are maybe strong in the public discourse and maybe strong in achievements, but are very, very poor, as you probably know is the fact that the engagement uh, of most of the foundations and the donors who care about Israel are doing fantastic works are mostly going to peace and human rights organizations. Peace and human rights organizations are needed in Israel. Human rights organizations are absolutely needed in Israel with the current situation, but they are not building a political movement. Uh, they are not working to, per se to persuade the regular Israeli to vote differently. Part of the research of the Adva Center is to point out the connection between the continuous of the settlements and the dismantling of the welfare state in Israel. This is, of course, work that we share also, that we do also. So I think that we need, again, like the AFT is doing, and, and like the, you know, in, in I, this is my third time in the United States, I always go to the EPI to meet Larry, Larry Michel, and I go to the AFT, and I go to the AFL-CIO, and I'm meeting students. Th th these are, these, I feel that these are my intimate partners in the American labor. And what we need to do is that we need to bring people who understand how social justice and peace are connected, you know, uh, to to help us build this movement in Israel and help you to build this movement in the United States. You know, this is progressive, progressive work that we need to be engaged in. So, so Rami, I wanted to ask you a question. We'll we'll get to you in a second. Um, so many in the American progressive movement, and particularly among progressive Jews, um, have been paying attention to. Um, the situation of Ethiopian Jews inside mm -hmm. Israel yeah. and to reports that um, the Israeli government was preparing to expel um, African refugees. Yeah. yeah. There are two different questions, yeah. though, though I, I think the, they both involve kind of issues of race. Sure. Um, and so I, th I thought, um, th you know, I, that might be an issue that you'd want to address. So actually, uh, one of our fellows at, uh, at the Berkeley Center, uh, Center is, is one of the leaders of the Ethiopian struggle in Israel, of the Ethiopian movement. It's a new generation, very impressive, very political, very progressive in all issues. 
that are trying to connect uh, social inequality with race inequality, which is, of course, a major issue in Israel, and we are strong supporters. So this is, again, this is, this is uh, 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 very connected uh, to what uh, Joanne said before. It's a generational gap. The older generation waited for the state to be good for them. The young generation, our friends in the Ethiopian community, are struggling. You know, they are, they are going to parties, they are going to run in big numbers, uh, in the local election with, that we have in um, in a five month, uh, and yeah, there is a discrimination. It's not a structural discrimination, you know. It's it's not, uh, um, but but it is. But there is a discrimination, and 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 people are fighting, uh, and because we have uh, this. What I see is a very positive Zionist ethos that you know groups from all over the world came to Israel to become one people. Uh, which again is very positive that sometimes, of course, that we forgot that the state didn't work for for everybody. Uh, the situation with the asylum seekers is, of course, uh, is of course very. Um, it's a perfect example for, because the, I I live in the south of Tel Aviv, right, and the majority of asylum seekers um, and the refugees live. Uh, in my neighborhood, or very close to my neighborhood in Israel. The Israeli right-wing government is not investing in south of Tel Aviv. They are doing nothing in rebuilding the social infrastructure, the schools, uh, community centers. And of course, when there are asylum seekers there, the most easiest thing for a right-wing government to say, well, your social condition, the inequality, poverty is because of these people who came to Africa, which is, of course, complete bullshit. right? So Israel should adopt a more humanitarian immigration policy. I do think that we have a right to have a very to 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 have a policy, right? We should say, well, we're going to accept these people. We're not going to accept these people. But what the right what the right wing government is doing is not actually trying to formulate any kind of policy because it's very easy for the government to say the people who are voting uh, that to say the people of South of Tel Aviv who are voting for the right that the social situation is the fault of the asylum seekers. This is a perfect example for a divide and rule politics that unfortunately the Israeli right and the American right and most of the populist right in the world are using. Hi, I'm with Mazon, a Jewish response to hunger. And so one of my questions around coalitions and um, building a progressive movement is how do you see connections between workers' rights and issues of food insecurity, childcare, alimony rules? How can we address poverty writ large and work together with an organizations to do that in Israel? I think that one of the, pr one of the problems that we it was it was really like a parallel process what is happening the israeli left lost in the last 20 years new ngos were were, were opened right so mazon and other organizations like ours and like other are doing fantastic work in issues of of policy of trying to influence the policy of the government uh, affecting public discourse i think what is the missing link in the civil society in israel in ngos in israel is the political element Right, I think that even if 20% of the energies that we are putting in NGO work will try to mobilize the people that we work with in NGOs, in community centers, in social organization to public pol to 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 participate in the political game, uh, we can we can have you can uh, you know we, can, we we have lots of coalition of social organization. We have millions of coalitions working on policy issues, legislation, policy, everything. What we are missing is the political link, right? Is, is, is working with the people that we work with on issues of hunger, inequality, poverty, labor relations, try to make them agents of change also in politics. This is our, this is our challenge. Right. Okay, so um, I think we've had a long um, and productive dialogue um, and I would like um, certainly, if any of you want to speak to Rami on an individual basis, you're welcome to come up when um, the larger meeting concludes. But I would like to thank you all um, on behalf of the Schenker Institute, the American Federation of Teachers, and Randy Weingarten, who, who is really unhappy about the fact that she could not be here this morning, um, although I think we can all understand um, you know why um, she had to be in West Virginia. Um, <laughs> yes. So. Yep. Yep. 
So, so thank you, um, and uh, thank Grammy, um, thank Joanne, um, and have and have a good rest of the day.